This was a lecture series on um, uh, applications of geometric thinking to algebraic topology. But let me, um, I'm going to instead focus on algebraic topology um, applied to, uh, to geometric questions. But of course, the flavor of algebraic topology we're going to use is, is well what I've been, um, what we've been developing here. So um, recall from last lecture, although you don't need uh, to, to know all the details, that given a knot, and for us, that's going to be um, a, a knot in a box, so to speak. Um, so it's just going to be an embedding from I. And now we'll just do the classical um, dimension, I cubed. Um, so it begins uh, at the top of the box, say, and ends at the bottom. And again, motivated by the, um, the, the first uh, real sort of not or link invariant, the, the Gauss integral, you consider the induced map on configuration spaces on this configurations functor, if you want. So, um, so you get a map from, and uh, we're going to compactify endpoints on the interval goes to endpoints in I cubed. And, um, and, and so, and this particular compactification, unlike the ones I was uh, talking about more uh, when we were doing some de-loopings in the Fulton McPherson operat, this is actually just a delta N. And this is homotopy equivalent to the usual configuration space. So something whose homology and cohomology we've talked about. So let me just give a question and conjecture. Um, so the basic question is, um, what of the knot, and, and we can just call this, um, I don't know, the, sometimes I call it GN for Gauss map, sometimes I call it EVN for evaluation, or if we want to be um, uh, formal, we can call this uh, conf n if, and if our knot is say um, uh, f then. So what of um, f does um, this induced map um, f, uh, c? Um, that's a vague question. And let me say, let me give a, a conjecture that will then give some evidence for. Um, EVN plus one F serves as, and, and, and by the way, we're just gonna look at, at uh, the impact on components. So there's a funny bit of algebraic topology, but the most basic algebraic topology um, is, is uh, separating something into components, that's pi zero. Every other functor, if you will, factors through that. So homotopy is pi zero of some loop space. Homology is pi zero of some mapping space. Um, so this map on pi zero serves as a universal the silly of invariant, and well, uh, I don't even know how precisely I'll define that because I want to get some ideas in front of us. And and um, again, in a lecture series like this, if somebody's watching, they can always pause and look at, um, for example, Barnaton's exposition on the silly of invariants. Um, let me emphasize over z, um, and this is of degree or type. in since I did the n plus one. Um, so that's a conjecture that I've been working um, on and off of for off and on for um, 20 years, basically. Um, I first heard Tom Goodley make some conjecture like this. He wasn't so precise uh, in 1996. So, um, and there's been progress on this. Um, we, we, we have a lot more progress just in the last few months. Um, uh, I'll, 
hopefully state a little bit of the work of uh, Danishka Kosanovich and um, Pedro Brito and Geoffroy Horel, um, three uh, relatively recent PhDs. Um, well, Danishka just finished, I think, last month, or maybe even this month. I don't know when, what the degree dates are. So, um, so let me uh, give one case where we know this. Um, so we know this for the conjecture is true. for um, n equals three. And the reason we know this is that we uh, explicitly have um, determined um, what the uh, what everything is there. So the um, so first let me go back and say what for the conjecture, um, you have to uh, evaluate, you have to uh, interpret, the uh, evaluation map. So let's. So uh, the evaluation map F is an element of this uh, space, which last time we talked about it as this homotopy limit of configurations in the cube, or um, another name you'll see that is um, uh, P in of the embeddings of an interval in a box. And this is in the Good Willie Vice PN. So this is just some space of maps from delta N into the configuration space. And the main idea is that this is, um, there's some, some category of uh, faces um, and and each face of delta n must go to a particular subspace of this configuration space. And by the way, I should also add tangent vectors um, to these uh, configuration spaces as we, we saw last time for the purposes of good Willie calculus. So F basically says for each face of delta n you, uh, maps to a corresponding subspace, and we'll see an example um, of the configuration space. Um, and, and, and for example, when, you know, uh, what are the faces of delta n? Um, so here we, the main thing is if uh, ti equals ti plus one, those are the co-dimension one faces, then in the configuration space, we must have xi equals xi plus one. Of course, this is a compactification, not the Cartesian product. And so there's still gonna be some data a tangent vector between those points, which, um, which tells us <coughs> sort of how they're different infinitesimally. But the wonderful thing is that, that we really can talk about these uh, uh, configurations where the, where the points quote unquote agree, and that defines a, a, a subspace that gives us a place for the face to map. This is kind of like, um, you know, if you if you think about this evaluation map or Gauss map for a knot like this, um, in, or even a classical knot, configurations of endpoints on a circle, that's basically um, that's a has a few different components, basically um, n minus one factorial components. So n factorial for an ordering, but up to cyclic ordering, there's just n minus one factorial. And then um, each component is contractible. Um, so the maps from that kind of space, you wouldn't normally think of as a, a very interesting object, but just like in a, a path space where you have a maps from an interval into X, it's not so interesting. Well, it's, it's exactly as interesting as X is. If I fix the endpoints of the paths, if they begin at the same point, I get a loop space. And similar here, you know, if you've got maps from the, the, the simplex, um, to a connected space, though those homotopy classes aren't that interesting. But if we fix the faces on different subspaces, we get an interesting homotopy type. So, um, so again, and we'll just call this PN um, for purposes of um, 
for purposes of, of, uh, of brevity and discussion. And so um, now let's, let me tell you about the, the conjecture for n equals three. And these, this is all work, um, goes back to the, well, I think it was published in 2005. Um, and let me say this was with, um, with uh, Ryan Budney, Jim Conant, and Kevin Scannell. Um, Ryan, by the way, who is using um, these same ideas uh, for knots in um, four-dimensional manifolds to, uh, I think I mentioned they, they've provided some exotic ways to co-bound a standard um, uh, two-sphere in the four-sphere by a three-disc. And you, you get at that through um, these kinds of uh, good will advice uh, techniques. So what do we prove? We prove that um, pi zero of P3 is isomorphic to Z. Um, we also show, we identified it with pi three of configurations of three points in a cube. In other words, we show that these are, which is also um, Z. I might say a little bit more about that calculation. Um, so that that makes some sense if we're if we've got a map from a three simplex into a configuration space. If all the boundaries of the three simplex uh, went to zero, um, then oh wait, this is this. Um, sorry, not um, there's there's a uh, this is pi three of the fiber of this two configurations of two points. So we'll get rid of um, some of the, the, the homotopy groups that uh, arise just on uh, configurations of two points. And that's of course a two sphere. Uh, once we get rid of all of those, um, there's just this uh, uh, Z left over and, um, and that's, that's actually not surprisingly what we identify the components of this space of maps with. And then we show that um, the, the map uh, EV3 or, or, or G3, so from uh, pi zero of, uh, again, I'll just, I'll just call it K now, is my space of embeddings of I and I cubed to uh, pi zero of P3 is, um, is the unique integer valued uh, type two uh, invariant, not invariant. And then we give a new way to, um, to calculate it, which I'll tell you about now. So, so that's just stating the conjecture in this case, but but here's the fun part. So so I've got my knot, and and I let's think about this EV three. So I've got a three simplex mapping to configurations of three points in the cube, and. Um, this pi three of configurations of three points, um, that's given by some whitehead product. And if you, um, if you watch the um, Hopf invariant lectures, uh, you know that those then are naturally detected by linking. So here is the fun thing we can do. Inside here, I'm gonna, look at a couple submanifolds. Um, I'm going to look at, at collinearities. Um, so that means that I've got x1, x2, x3, which are each uh, point in, I, in the cube. 
which are collinear. Um, but I'm going to look at two different ones. COL1 is going to be the ones where they're collinear, and X1 is in the middle. So there's not a, 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 an ordering on the three points, but there is um, an ordering up to, uh, to global uh, uh, looking first or last, uh, looking from the left or the right on the line. And so the, the space of collinearities, uh, the subspace of the configuration points where things are collinear um, is really got just in this case, uh, three components depending on which is in the middle. So X, I, X, J, X, K. COL I is where I is in the middle. So COL three is collinear where X three in the middle. And then here's the um, here's the fun, because I can then um, under some transversality, which is a little bit uh, trickier because um, I'm allowed to deform my knot a bit, um, but that doesn't directly deform the evaluation map. But in fact, um, people I think, including Elizabeth Den uh, and, and a group of people, uh, have shown that we get uh, there's there's pretty general transversality. For these induced maps of configuration spaces. So now let's, um, so under transversality, well, this is a co dimension two submanifold, right? Because x1 and x2 are always going to be collinear. And then for x3 to, to be collinear with them, it's now sitting on a line instead of um, the whole three dimensional space. So that's a co dimension two condition. So the pre image is going to be co dimension two, and that's some manifold. So, so that's some one manifold. And, um, but then let's look at what happens on the boundaries. So this is because it's a, a, a simplex, of course, has boundaries as corners. The one manifold is going to have uh, boundaries. So um, let's, let's contemplate um, what is it, what about the, the boundary of um, the pre image of, say, COL1? What faces of that's got to be on some on the boundary of the simplex, but which faces? What does it mean to be on the boundary? Well, the boundary uh, of the simplex, I can either have t0 equals t1 or t1 equals t2 or t2 equals t3 or um, t3 equals t4. And um, T0 is always zero and T4 in this case is one because I'm just looking at T1, T2, T3. But this way you can just say TI equals TI plus one universally. Now, um, what's the geometry if T0 equals T1 in this evaluation map? That just means that in, in my, um, I evaluate at three points and my X1 is down at the bottom of the box. X2 and X3 will be somewhere else. And, um, and the point is that when I'm looking at places where point one is on the line in the middle, uh, that's impossible unless, and, and this, is a, a, this is a restriction we can make on the embeddings that they never touch the faces other than at their endpoints. So if they don't touch the faces than at, other than at their endpoints, X1 here can never be on a line collinear with X2 and X3. So this, this does not occur. So no, um, no pre-image on this face. Whereas if T1 equals T2, What can happen is that you do get such a line, a special kind of line, which is fine. Um, remember, I'm compactifying the configuration space. So you can't just say, well, um, T1 equals T2 means X1 equals X2, and that's not allowed in the configuration space. Again, I should, um, I should indicate that here, that I, we really want this compactification. So um, in this case, on the knot, and I should have maybe drawn the knot 
um, before because x2 and x3 have to be along the knot. On the knot somewhere, I've got um, a place where uh, there's a tangent vector because that's going to be what goes between, say, x2 and x1. And there's a tangent vector that um, points then to the third point at the knot. So again, underlying this somewhere, there's a knot. And um, the tangent vector um, from, um, from x2 to x1, so sort of the, the opposite of the tangent vector for x1 to be in the middle, um, points at the, the, the knot at the place x3. Okay. So I hope that's my, my artistic uh, abilities aren't um, the best, but hopefully as I was saying that, I mean, I can try to draw it one more time, um, uh, even larger. So here's the knot. And at some place, as I go from, um, let's see, I might have to, as I go from x2 to x, x, x2 to x1, so I want to go kind of backwards along the knot, maybe. Um, well, no, this would be x2 to x1 this way. Um, sorry, I didn't think to prepare this in, in, uh, in such detail, but um, here we go. So at, at some point, as I go, um, no, this is still, <laughs> um, well, let me, let me do it this way. Uh, one more time. What I'm gonna do is just gonna draw in at some place uh, a, a picture of the, the knot will, okay, so this is my x2 and this is my x1. There's a tangent vector there, um, which I'll draw in red. And the point is that the knot has come around, so to speak, and intersects that, that tangent um, line intersects the knot in a third point x3. And this is a collinearity of the, the three points x1, x2, x3. So um, yes, you can, you can have a boundary on that face. Um, no, you can't have it if t1 and t, t2 equals t3, then x2 equals x3, and they're sort of an infinitesimal uh, configuration. And so um, x1 can't be in the middle there. Whereas if t3 is uh, 1, that just means that um, uh, I wanted the knot to go from top to bottom. And here I drew x1 at the bottom. I should have drawn x1 at the top. Um, but in this last one, um, t3 is at the bottom, x3 is at the bottom x1 and x2 can, can be in a place where x1 is collinear. Um, they're all collinear and x1 is in the middle. So that can happen. So, so uh, this one manifold with boundary uh, can have a boundary on two different faces. And then very similar analysis says that the, the boundary of um, the pre-image of collinearities of three points, sorry, collinearities of the three points with x3 in the middle, it can sit on, um, uh, lies in the, the ones we just excluded, t1, t0 uh, equal t1 and uh, t2 equals t3 faces, but not the others. And so, um, so that means back up here, let's, let's, um, 
let's go back up to, or let me redraw the three simplex down below. So we have four faces of this and the, um, let me just indicate their colors. So this, uh, the pre-image of EV3, um, uh, under EV3F of CoL1, we'll indicate in purple, and uh, the pre-image of CoL3 we'll do in yellow. And the point is that their boundaries are on opposite faces, and there can be some uh, components with no boundary. But um, if this is sort of in the back two faces, then the purple is more on the front two faces. And I haven't uh, sort of uh, and so these can um, can link. So what we actually show is that the um, So, uh, so now let's let's remember we're giving uh, a, a knot f up to isotopy class that gives rise to the study of this ev three f up to homotopy, but we play this Hopf invariant game. And um, and then the funny th fun thing is that we, we're doing a little bit of homotopy. We start with a geometric topology question. We translate it to homotopy theory, but we do this homotopy theory geometrically. And we uh, we say in order to understand EV3 up, up to um, homotopy, we consider the linking number of the pre-images of these collinearity submanifolds. Which is some geometric topology again, and um, and and this gives a, an isomorphism of of sets. All of these are isomorphic to Z, and um, and these are isomorphisms. Um, and um, but there's more. So how would you actually calculate this linking number? So the standard way to calculate a linking number is to project. So let's project. And this will be just onto the T1 and T3 coordinates. So what does it mean to have, we, that would mean that we, um, so we have a collinearity. So we have one collinearity at some T1, T2, T3 and another and this is this has say one in the middle and another at um, uh, t one and some uh, some different t two t three. Um, if we calculate linking number by projection, this is a very classical thing where we then just count crossings, if you will, and those crossings would correspond to two different sets of collinearities with the same t two with the same t one and t three and different t twos. And what this really means is then that means there's a collinearity of four points. Of, and I really should say collinearity of f of t1, f of, uh, so collinearity of f of t1, f of t2, f of t2 prime, f of t3. And well, that's, that is just something you can count on the knot. So in our original knot, I can ask, does a line cross it? Um, once again, my artistic abilities are gonna limit me here. But does a line cross it? in four points.
and um, it's not just any alternating collinearity. By the way, that those go um, by the name quadrasecant for obvious reasons. And we get not just any, but I won't go through this bit of analysis. It's it's um, just the alternating quadrasecants that we count with signs. So that's kind of fun. That's something that the the, the, the not theorists uh, hadn't noticed before. Um, uh, that you could you could do this. Uh, there's two maybe reasons. Um, they realize that uh, that there that if there was a good count of quadrasecants, it would be type two. Um, by the way, that it's discrete again. Let's just go through that quickly. Um, four points on a knot is uh, parameterized by a delta four. Any two points are um, on a line. To have those two more, that's two uh, co-dimension two conditions. So this again will be a discrete count. And not theorists knew that this would be, um, by the way, there's only one uh, uh, type two invariant. So, so this is that invariant, um, but you have to only look at the alternating ones. And also it is important here that we're working with these knots in a box. I don't think this theorem is uh, true if you look at circular knots, uh, for example. So, um, so it's it's fun. We we found this new very geometric way to um, to produce a knot invariant um, by looking at this evaluation map. And let me just say it's open and something that um, I'm, I've started to think about a, a, a bit and we made a little progress on, but no further. Um, but let me just say there's there's no uh, to this point further examples, unfortunately, even of, um, of explicit knot invariants. Uh, no further, let me just say similar examples. I'll tell a story uh, of knot invariants, um, which are uh, that one um, obtains through analysis of um, of this uh, delta n to conf n uh, cubed v and f map so um, so I'm very interested in, in in potentially having further examples. Let me place this result in some context uh, now, and uh, maybe Christine can correct me if, uh, if I get some details wrong here or there. Um, over further. So I'm going to um, be very brief of this and, and not give a lot of details. Well, maybe I'll just sort of. So the, sto the story really starts with uh, Jones's work, um, this famous Jones polynomial, very elementary to define, um, even though he didn't come at it from an elementary point of view. Um, and then uh, in the same um, sort of Fields Medal citation, Witten interpreted this uh, in the following remarkable way. Uh, you take a knot and you want to make a number and the natural thing would be to be to, to, to take the energy somehow. And of course that depends on a connection and so then you want to, to make this invariant. So you would want to integrate over all connections. And this is something that physicists do. And Witten indicates that, that you can get the Jones polynomial by, by doing so. 
And then what he does is he actually sets his uh, student uh, Barnatan in uh, making a perturbative expansion of, of this idea and trying to understand that very first knot invariant you can get, which happens to be the same knot invariant that I just told you about, um, maybe up to some, some real number uh, because uh, they work with integrals and work over the, the real numbers. Um, at the same time, Vasiliev was thinking about uh, knots uh, through Alexander duality. You have to do some finite uh, approximations and, and those are, are um, technically difficult to, to work through. Um, I had my student Chad Giusti sort of do this in a different uh, setting, which is actually cleaner. Um, but what he found was that, um, uh, well, after Vasilya, you, you have then um, uh, Berman and Lin, who found this elegant formulation that the derivative of uh, a knot, well, really the nth derivative of a knot invariant, once you, if you want to, um, it's, it's not a knot invariant anymore, it's an invariant of um, knots with singularities. So I've got some, some singularities. Is gonna be the sum of, well, if I have the singularities, the knot is, um, is oriented. And so I can um, look at the, the pairs and there's a standard way to resolve things and you get a sum with um, two to the n terms. And I'm gonna take my original invariant and apply it to each of those terms. Um, and I'm gonna get a knot by resolving each of the, um, uh, each of the double points in either a positive or negative direction. So this is a, a sort of a formal derivative. It's defining something as a, um, as a difference between two, um, two, two uh, the invariant of two different knots, um, but then you do it inductively. And so um, you get two to the n terms with signs. Um, and the berman lin condition is that you are type N um, means that your N plus first derivative is zero. Um, and it's a funny definition. It takes a while to appreciate that, well, are there even such things? Um, in fact, most such things won't be um, finite type. But the kinds of counts that I uh, showed you with the quadrasecants, um, it's not that hard to convince oneself that those should be finite type. They're really, if, if I have um, a, a, a list of singularities uh, sufficiently many, and I guess in this case three, then my quadrasecant can't go through, um, um, my, my quadrasecant counts uh, would, would ultimately have to involve um, some canceling pairs and would vanish. So um, the next part of the story, uh, so Kinsevich, and I won't even sort of give the main combinatorics that really uh, uh, reflects the power of his uh, approach, but uh, and then bought Taub's uh, uh, using some of ideas, his ideas. And let me say that some of these ideas really continue to be developed by people like Catania. And you can even uh, think about Wilbacher uh, to this day. Um, so the, the, the fun thing is, um, yeah, I'll, um, they come up with, uh, with, with, with integrals that, um, realize these invariants. Um, 
the Kinsevich integral is still the, the, the state of the art, really. It's the only one that we fully understand in a sense. Um, the Bottobs integrals still have some um, interesting open questions uh, about their existence. And then there's a couple other approaches. Um, Habiro and independently um, Gusarov uh, show that these are invariants up to that, that your finite type invariants agree if you differ by some moves. So, um, let me at least say a little bit. So you, so Kontevich and Bottaubs give um, integral realizations. And I'll say more about all of their work in a, in a moment. They sort of say um, an equivalence relation not on the invariance, but just on the knots that, that de then defines what it means to be a, a finite type invariance. And uh, similar, by the way, uh, are um, Conant and Teichner. And now there's um, work by Techner student uh, Kosanovich, which also gives a, a different equivalence relation. And I, what I want to do is I'm going to shrink this substantially because it's I wanted to make one point, which is that all of these require different interpretations of graphs. So let me actually um, yeah. Let me go to the right and say, what, do, what are the, so all of these finite type invariants, they invariably have some kind of um, graph theoretic um, aspect of their, their combinatorics, their definition, um, that's then reflected in the geometry of the knot or, or some, yeah, some, you know, geometry or again, just, or combinatorics of the, the, the knot, um, the knot diagram. So, um, so let me just say here, cause it's, I, this is an interesting observation that, um, what roles, what role or roles do graphs play? in each of these uh, interpretations. So in the Jones interpretation, or sorry, in the Witten interpretation, graphs are literally um, Feynman diagrams. Let me make this a little bit better, bigger. Which is kind of exciting. <laughs> um, Feynman diagrams play a substantial role in this um, in this part of knot theory. I mean, there's certainly these days with Kovanov homology and Heger Fleur, there's um, the 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 and their ability to resolve some real subtle questions about mutations and things. There's certainly other tools that um, that excite people. But it's 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 fun in itself that this um, you you literally take the what the uh, particle physicists do to make calculations in quantum field theory, you take their Feynman diagrams and you're led to not invariance. So, you know that's again what Barnapan's PhD thesis was, and then Kinsevich and he used this um, remarkably, and then. Um, And this is not too far from, from the, the Feynman diagrams because he uh, produces explicit differential forms on configuration spaces. These play an essential role in the formality proofs. 
um, which lead to understanding higher dimensional uh, knot spaces um, extremely well over the rational numbers. Um, and um, yeah, and, and these are the same um, kinds of ideas uh, with variation um, that also uh, play key roles in his work in deformation quantization, et cetera. Bott and Taubes have said pretty much the same thing, um, but Bott especially uh, thought about the role these play in the rational homotopy theory. of configuration spaces. Um, and, and these ideas together, again, this is uh, what, what Vilvacher is, is certainly a master of, um, this interplay between the physics of, um, of Feynman diagrams and that kind of thing, those ideas, and the fact that they are so closely tied to the topology of configuration spaces, especially the rational homotopy of configuration spaces, there's a close dictionary, again, um, we can't, uh, Vilvacher is probably the most successful at, at straddling both sides, but these were essential in producing um, a universal uh, finite type invariant over the rational numbers, um, which was, which is a, again, a, it's a fantastic construction. Uh, remarkable that it came so soon after the, um, uh, Vasiliev and Brown and Lin, et cetera. Um, ah, I think I skipped over those folks. Um, that should really have been uh, next in the list, but let me, so let me indicate. Um, uh, in the sense I already, uh, Vasiliev and um, Berman and Lin, they're the graphs, um, the graphs indicate singularities. So for example, if I, um, I'm gonna write it this way, one, three, two, four, means that I've got a knot that um, has a couple singularities. with the combinatorics that if I follow the orientation of the knot, first I go one double point is at T1, T3, and then the other is, um, let me indicate that in, so here, what we have is that F of T1 equals F of T3, while over here, F of T2 equals F of T4. Um, and by the way, I should have said the, um, let me emphasize that the differential forms on configuration spaces, um, we've talked about those. We have, for example, um, A12, A23, A24. You can make a graph like this, one to two, two to three, and two to four. Um, so, so those are um, graphs that correspond to um, differential forms. And the key is that you need ones, um, there's ones like this, which correspond to a cohomology, but you also have forms which <coughs> co-bound the Arnold identity and other are the Arnold and other identities. That's exactly what you need in rational homotopy theory to get a handle, full handle on the homotopy type from the co-chains. It, it doesn't just suffice to, to look at um, cohomology, but you need to understand how the, um, for things like Massey products, how the relations are related, so to speak. Um, so um, yeah, so that's the, the Vasily of Berman Lin was singularities, Witten Feynman diagrams, Kinsevich um, differential forms on configuration spaces, Bott and Taubes thinking of that in terms of a rational homotopy theory. Um, 
Habiro and Gusarov. Are, are um, it's really sort of moves or or surgeries. And again, I'm not gonna. There's there's references that I might provide, but but here, if I've got a, a knot, maybe and some, and I'm thinking about an edge on it. So the the graph is just this edge. Um, you you really start to um, Uh, you 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 think of this. Uh, there, there's a surgery to be made, where the knot. Um, now, well, this will look like no, it won't look like, like a link, of course. Um, where now, um, I'm gonna make a little hop link where that edge was, and and that's some sort of new knot. In, in red, it still uh, goes along. Um, let me erase these bits. Um, so these are, this is one example of a move. We're gonna say K and K prime are equivalent if they differ by certain sets of surgeries. And the theory has to do with um, then Seeing that the the that if they are uh, equivalent by such moves, then they um, then their finite type invariants agree. So it's just a very different approach, but again, a very different interpretation of these graphs. Um, and but similarly, I don't think I'll I'll say much about it other than the name. But um, Teichner and his students. Um, uh, have these gropes, which are um, surfaces with singular, with very prescribed singularities, and two knots share their um, their finite type invariants, if and only if you can get from one to the other um, by. Okay, these are supposed to be knotted, but by one of these kinds of surfaces with. Um, with, with some very prescribed singularities. Um, and you can, and these, these kind of have an iterated feel. There's a, there's a lower central series feel to all of these as well. Okay. The, the, what I wanted to, um, to then say is, uh, is the main question. Um, so, the, so proving the main conjecture Um, will lead to some new interpretation, will almost certainly lead to some uh, new interpretation of graphs in this context. And now let me let me elaborate a bit on that claim and and sort of finish up by talking about some um, progress on the conjecture. So, um, Budni uh, Konant Koichev. So we. We made a, a, a trade for collaborators. Uh, we show, first of all, that um, pi zero EVN um, is, uh, is a group homomorphism. An abelian group homomorphism. It's not so easy. Um, one reason I said pi zero is a universal kind of algebraic topology um, functor, but um, it doesn't naturally have a group structure. So it's hard to call it algebraic topology if you don't have a group structure. But um, 
but there is, you know, there's there's no group structure sitting uh, around on pi zero of an arbitrary space. If the space itself, of course, has a multiplication, um, then then so and and so this is um, on on these knots you have the connect sum. So so the the left hand side on the space of knots and and up to isotopy, the the sum is um, is just stacking, so to speak. And this is actually uh, commutative because I can take the lower one and sort of pass it through the upper one. Um, and uh, we show that, that this evaluation map is compatible with a, a commutative, homotopy commutative multiplication on that space of maps. And this is something that, that is also, there's plenty of people like Turchin and Dwyer Hess um, who also prove that in different ways, but we, we prove this um, sort of in a very hands-on way. And then we show that the spectral sequence uh, so uh, there's, there's two more sort of substantial things. Uh, and let me say n plus one. So it is type n. So we're not saying it's universal, but it's at least the right kind of object. Um, here we, we, we use the um, Habiro uh, formulation. Um, we then show that the spectral sequence is, well, it's one of abelian groups for pi zero and pi one. Um, again, that's um, something that people who work in, in especially something like stable homotopy theory, everything is set up to be an abelian group. Um, there's just, it's a very abelian theory, if you will. Um, so this is uh, taken for granted in many settings, but then if you have to work to, to do it, it's, it's another, um, it's another uh, matter. Um, and then we show that the, um, the, the E2, uh, terms in degrees uh, minus n plus one comma n plus one. So it's total degree zero, which are subquotients um, actually it's just quotients of pi n plus one configurations of n plus one in a cube. So this very standard algebraic topology, those E2 terms um, are um, what you would expect are isomorphic to the conjectured um, form for um, the universal Vassiliev of invariant over the integers, universal type in invariant over Z. So in fact, one can prove, so that's as far as we've got. Let me also say one other thing that's, uh, I don't know if it's even mentioned in the paper, um, these are, uh, uh, so they are quotients of free Z modules. And that implies that our friends, the Hopfen variants should detect them. And believe it or not, this whole theory of Hopfen variants that I um, talked about in some of the early uh, lectures was motivated the development. Um, the reason I developed them was exactly for this problem <laughs> to understand the homotopy class of, of maps from a simplex into a configuration space that you, you get when you're looking at a knot. So this very simple idea 
I realized that, that we didn't understand um, invariance of homotopy classes um, explicitly in a way that you would need to make explicit not invariance. Um, so let me just say then there's some uh, remarkable progress. Um, Danichka Kosanovich um, showed that the map from that this map um, that we're trying to make invariance from is surjective. <laughs> and again, these are funny things to, um, to say what a big result. Um, but in fact, if you're trying to make not invariance and I have this beautiful uh, set, let me make a, 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 an invariant with, um, with image in, in the monster group. Um, well, every not is gonna have value identity element. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's fine to have values in the monster group, but if you're not invariant doesn't take those values, then it's not so easy. You don't really have um, uh, values in, the, in, in where you think they, that you do. So you can do all sorts of algebraic topology to cal calculate pi naught of uh, Pn plus one, but uh, even if it looks like the right thing, you're not gonna get the right not invariance uh, without this kind of statement. So I was very, very happy that she proved this as uh, part of her thesis. And then very recently, um, Boavida de Brito and Horel show that the spectral sequence collapses. So the, um, the mod P spectral sequence collapses in degrees less than P and um, so that means that the conjecture is true so it implies the conjecture in those degrees and the mod pre version of um, the conjecture only um, but um, but no the, uh, but their techniques are, are very algebraic topological. They're, they involve these Grotendieck Teichmuller techniques. Um, um, so in particular, no new uh, actual explicit not invariance. It tells you that the tower um, has um, all the information. And I should, um, should have said back at the beginning of the progress, and this is actually not recent. These are all results basically this year, last year, this year, 2006, I wanna say, Volich shows a conjecture over Q, but um, using the same bot Taub's invariance. So, in a sense, it says um, he pr proves a, 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 a related conjecture, uh, a different tower that's uh, related. Uh, you realize the type in invariance at the two nth stage. Um, so we know these towers have all this information. Um, in particular, there's new potential information. And um, well, I don't think anybody knows then if there are any. Um, mod p such invariants which are not reductions of say of, of um, integer invariants that you can also then get through the Kinsevich integral um, but in any case uh, so far we we know that there's more information to be had plenty of information from Vol Volch's result but again that's the previous um, uh, invariants giving that the bot tabs integrals now potentially new information based on uh, Danitschka's and Pedro's and Jafar's uh, very recent work, um, but we don't know what the not invariants are. And um, yeah, I've got some ideas about Hoff invariants uh, that I happily share um, and are giving, um, uh, leading to 
what look like similar uh, kinds of formulas for Milner invariants uh, that, that some folks out there have already uh, looked at. Um, in any case, it's, it's a fun application of these ideas, the geometric view of algebraic topology, because we're actually starting with some geometric topology, producing this uh, evaluation map, and then using this kind of geometric algebraic topology to understand that. So that's, uh, I think that's a good note to end. Um, I will uh, stop the... Um,